and thank you all for coming in such numbers. Um, if your phone is on, could you please turn it off? It's only an hour. We'll all live. Um, my name is Yasmin Alibi Brown. I'm a journalist and a weekly columnist on The Independent, and we're going to talk about this subject, feminism and privilege. I just want to make some opening remarks. One of which is, just the subject reminds me of how old I am and how old this subject is. Because when I came in 1972 from Uganda, never having heard the word feminism, although my mother in all ways was a feminist, she had to work, she had a hopeless husband, my father, she took care of everybody and she dressed up to the nines and went on her own to evening shows of films which made the community call her a tart, but she didn't give a damn, but she didn't know the word feminism. So coming to here, and I went to Oxford for my um, postgraduate studies, I confess I found it baffling because what they were talking about as issues for women were not the issues I'd come away from in Africa where often it was life and death issues for mothers and their children and for sexual violence and impoverishment and all of that. And we had the same debates and we had the same conversations. Um, where we are at now is both the same and different because of course over the decades things, things have moved along and the younger generation thinks and behaves very differently, I think, and for the better on the most part. Yesterday I was speaking at a, a very good session on raising boys and it, it was really interesting how different speakers had different preoccupations. And there was actually somebody from Uganda, a, a, a poet, who he has a son and a, a daughter, young children. And he was talking about how he as a black father was trying to raise his children differently um, um, in the way perhaps that his generation were brought up and the generation before. And afterwards, two black women came to me actually quite um, uh, exercised and said why and one of the speakers was had is um, doing the pink stink campaign you must you know the pink stink campaign the whole thing about pink and blue clothes and toys for girls and toys for boys and there was somebody who was an academic who was looking at gender and how you can raise children without falling into gender traps. And one of the examples she gave was that she, you, you know, when her son wanted to have gold painted nails, she thought that was cool. So these two women came up to me and, and said, why are we talking about painted, to, painted nails? And why are we talking about toys? Why am I not, why is nobody talking about the fact that I'm a black mother and my son has three times been put into prison? What kind of feminism is this? So, you can see the debates carry on, and I'm so pleased we're all here to talk about the differences, the shared struggles, how we can all feed, feed into each other's um, priorities, because we must. As women, we must. And as men who are in this audience, you're part of, of where we want to be. So we must talk across gender, across race, across ethnicity, across religions. Um, and I think sometimes that it is very difficult for white feminists in particular to say what they really want to about other cultures and other uh, people who, who live as fellow citizens. Because there is this constant tremble, this fear that they mustn't interfere because they don't understand or it might, it might be offensive or whatever. But I actually think in the 21st century, we have to move beyond that. We have to say, when a young woman is murdered, uh, raped and murdered in, in Delhi, 
She was all of us in this room. She was us and we are her. It doesn't matter that she was Indian. Uh, and when, so we should have more open but respectful conversations. So I hope people in this room feel completely confident in saying or asking questions that they want to ask because we should be able to do that across these false boundaries. So I'm going to start with our very first um, speaker. I've given them permission to speak for one minute or speak for 11. I'm not very authoritarian on that. And then we'll open it up. Um, oh, I forgot to tell you the other story about my feminist days in the 70s. I eventually became part of the club because I burnt my bra. I really burnt my bra. A black lace bra, which was so lovely. And I burnt it. And the sisters thought I was one of them. There you are. Um, so Rennie, I'm coming to Rennie first. Rennie Edo Lodge um, is a writer, and I've read her stuff uh, on Feminist Times, which is a fantastic new development, I have to say. Well, not new. Returning to a kind of history. Um, she's uh, a very strong and very articulate black feminist and um, involved in Black Feminists, a group for women of color to discuss issues that affect them. In 2010, she won a commendation from Channel 4's Best Young Blogger competition and the Voice newspaper has named her the one to watch. Um, I've read her in The Guardian, the, in my newspaper, in The Independent, Open Democracy, and so on. And um, uh, we've, some of you have probably also heard her on BBC Radio 4's Woman's Hour. So, um, and she, it says, she tweets a lot. I do. <laughs> Thanks, Yasmin. Uh, so, first off, it's really good to see the room so packed out. This is obviously a really hot topic, and um, it's one that we have to discuss, and it's one that we need to accept and move on from. So intersectionality is not new, although, you know, if you've been reading the left-leaning liberal press over the past three years and you think it only cropped up into existence two years ago when white feminist commentators suddenly realised that this was something that they had to be concerned about uh, for good or for bad. Um, but intersectionality, the term, actually was first coined by a black feminist academic, a Harvard academic, um, Kimberly Crenshaw, who, by the way, is speaking at the London School of Economics this month. Um, so get on that if you're interested in this topic. It's free. Um, but she actually uh, wrote an essay um, articulating a phenomenon that many black feminists had been speaking about for hundreds and hundreds of years, and she gave it a name. Now, it may seem like quite a new uh, word, but actually, the term sexism is a new word. It was actually only coined in 1965. So when there's debates about whether this word is even useful, we have to remember that we need to give problems a name in order to be able to solve them. And that essay that she um, wrote, uh, coining the term intersectionality, was in 1989, the year I was born. Uh, so it's, it's not new at all. And um, it's a phenomenon that many black women before me uh, have articulated. Um, it's about it's linked oppressions sexism is not the only issue that many women face because we live in a structurally unequal society and in this structurally unequal society um, there's many inequalities that's, that interlink, in, interlink and shape people's lives. I'm a black woman and my life has been shaped structurally by structural sexism as much as structural racism and I was just in a ses session about being mixed race and um, I'm not mixed race myself uh, but I remember very keenly having to come to terms with my blackness as a six-year-old when I turned to my mum and I said, mum, when am I going to turn white? Because all the good people on TV are white and all the good people, I'll know the bad people on TV are black, so I'll go, I must be a good person, so I must be turning white at some point. And she turned around to me and she said, no, Rennie, you're, you're black and you will always will be black. And suddenly I had to start, at that very young age, questioning the representations of my colour of skin all around me. My life has been shaped by structural sexism. I'm a survivor of sexual violence. I deal with street harassment on a weekly basis. Um, I'm sure as feminists we all understand how structural sexism exists and shapes our lives. And I think that it's really important as, as feminists, as people who are touched by different structural oppressions and those, the way those things are linked to shape our lives, that we can't pull these things apart 
for me, I can't get involved in a, a feminism that only focuses on sexism because sexism isn't the only battle that I'm fighting. So I guess recognizing your privilege is about being honest about your power. And frankly, as feminists, this is what we're asking men to do. This is exactly what we're asking men to do. So we shouldn't be above doing it ourselves. It's about recognizing your power as well as recognizing your oppression. So I'm a black woman. I've spoken a little bit about how um, I've been affected by uh, racism and sexism, um, but I'm also not disabled, and you know that gives me huge advantages in life. I also pass as straight, and I'm in a relationship with a man that hugely affects the way people um, treat me in everyday life. Um, I'm university educated. I, I come off as well spoken. That hugely affects the way that people treat me in life. And there's a long list of privileges that um, shape my life and give me structural advantages over lots of people. I grew up in poverty, but my work currently gives me lots of access to middle classness. I can't deny that. Recognizing your privilege is about being honest about your power. Um, we live in a structurally racist, structurally sexist, structurally unequal society. And I think it's facetious and and dishonest to pretend that our opinions exist outside of that. Recognizing your privilege is also about recognizing your own prejudices. And our own prejudices are things that we battle with every day to overcome. But just by calling yourself a feminist or an anti-racist doesn't mean that you're suddenly, you'll suddenly never be racist again or suddenly never be sexist again. It's a constant work. It's a journey. So as, benefits, uh, as feminists, I've had a lot of coffee, so just bear with me, right? <laughs> As feminists, we know that men benefit from structural sexism. Patriarchy is a system created by and for men. It hurts all genders, but men benefit from it the most. So what does it mean when we discuss white privilege in particular? And why is the term, or the phrase, white feminism used as a derogatory term increasingly often? It's important, I think, to understand how whiteness operates as a political structure and how it relates to feminism in particular. So I've written before about how I consider uh, feminism that only uh, considers white pro priorities to essentially just be the feminist wing of a white-dominated political consensus, which is what we're working within. Whiteness is, and white supremacy in particular, and I'm not talking about you know, the KKK or the EDL, the bad races that are over there that mean that we don't confront our own prejudices. I'm talking about um, white as the norm and everything else deviating with it. Uh, it's, it's a politics that engages itself with myths such as, I don't see race, I'm colorblind. It's a politics that insists that talking about race actually fuels racism, thereby denying people of color to actually talk about the racism we face. Whiteness positions itself as the norm and everything else deviates from it. Uh, South African scholar, Dr. Gillian Shu actually explains white privilege in a way that effectively, I think, explains widespread attitudes towards race and feminism and on the left in general. She says, white privilege is invisible to white people themselves, and this in turn creates a major problem in public discourse. Often, discussions that involve white people in the public, even when the participants are diverse, are framed within what white people see and what they think. So, I'll give you an example of how this plays out in feminis feminism, and first, disclaimer, I've worked with and greatly respect the people who are running and are at the center of the campaign that I'm about to mention. We've collaborated together in the past, and I see in a concerted effort to, for them, from them to apply an intersectional approach to their work. It's, so what I'm about to say is an indictment of their campaigning, but instead it's a challenge to the wisdom surrounding their campaign. So when we talk about No More Page 3, there's a given line that the sun objectifies women and that, that this is degrading to women. And I think that's fine to some extent. This is one of the first issues I cut my teeth on when I was getting involved in feminism all those years ago. But rarely is the argument made that media like The Sun's page three also perpetuates white supremacist beauty ideals and actually imposes a white racist standard of, of beauty on everyone. And we all attempt to try and access it. So can anybody remember the last time that they saw a page three girl or a woman in a louse mag that wasn't white? These representations actually push the widely held belief that women of color aren't even attracted enough to appear on those magazines in the first place. Now, what I'm not saying is that I want a uh, fair representation in these magazines, <laughs> but I am saying that I think that women of color rarely see ourselves in these representations of beauty, and that in itself is because we live in a structurally racist society where white women have the privilege of being able to access that level of being seen as beautiful in a way that black women aren't. And I think that this white supremacy is further entrenched 
fab, <laughs> in issues that we're struggling with in black communities, in particular colorism and shadism. I, you may not be a, sort of uh, familiar with these issues, but it's an issue that directly and disproportionately affects women of color because it's, the, it's a belief that the lighter your skin is, the more attractive you are. And black women and women of color, we grow up hating the color of our skin. Um, so why is this an issue? Why isn't this an issue that's at the center of feminist opposition to page three? I actually think it's because our movement chooses to center on the issues that affect the most privileged women rather than centering the struggles on the most marginalized women. And actually, I think that we can see that things are changing. And a really great example of that is the work that women for, Re for refugee women are doing in terms of uh, women asylum seekers. But as long as we keep centering our struggles around the most privileged women, then much like patriarchy, the rest of us are expected to adapt to these one-size-fits-all priorities. So to conclude, as feminists, we can all sort of resonate with the idea of feeling excluded from discourse. And I think in my darkest moments, and I've said this publicly before, but in my darkest moments when I'm feeling excluded from feminism um, because, <laughs> because I'm raising racism and I'm getting this backlash, I feel like saying, you know what, there is no shared female experience because I have no shared solidarity with people who can't recognize structural racism at all. But actually, I think that the shared solidarity for all of us as women is, is that feeling of being marginalized from something that was not built for us. And actually, we can organize around that. Um, we, we all have to fight for a place at the table. But just because we fight on one front, it doesn't mean that we can't inflict oppressive pain on another. So if I told you about the amount of times that I'd faced backlash from white women for daring to talk about race, we'd be here all day. But I'm not here to talk about that. If we're interested in liberation, we all have a duty to examine how our own words and actions um, support a, a structurally unequal status quo and inflict the same exclusion that we feel on others. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, and the shadism is a very important point, actually, about how we ingest the same values. If you look at the Asian newspapers at the back of it, where people are advertising for husbands and wives, inevitably they say, homely, educated, not too educated, wheat and complexion. Always wheat and complexion means light skin. So it's very, very deep. In, in, in many of our cultures. I'm going to ask Mercia to speak next. Uh, Mercia McMahon, how do I say it? McMahon. McMahon is a London based author and trans activist who writes on um, trans matters at Trans Rights. She co facilitates the St. James's Piccadilly LGBT group. It's a wonderful place, St. James's in Piccadilly, actually and is a founder of Christians Together at Pride. Her writings include a PhD in philosophical theology, a chapter on trans theology for a proposed book by a Christian trans organization, the short story Forgiveness about domestic abuse, and a work in progress novel Seattle in Shorts um, about the negative pasts of Seattle's minorities. And her next project is a non-fiction book on activist responses. This, this was one of the most shocking things I remember that's happened in recent years. Um, the suicide of the trans woman, Lucy Meadows, um, which Mercia is now writing a non-fiction book on. Which is, I'm really pleased you're doing this because it's almost as it, it happened and it faded, didn't it, from, from collective memory. So Marcia. The floor is yours. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so you now my blog, which I primarily write about trans matters, is called Trans Rights. And um, as you're hearing this, rather than reading it, but I say that's rights as in with a pen or with a keyboard. Although the invitation to take part in the panel was saying I might particularly say something about trans rights as in legal rights. And so I've recently changed the subtitle of my blog. It used to say trans rights as in writing and wrongs. <laughs> it now says trans rights as in law and wrongs. The wrongs is there because I'm 
particularly known in the trans community, I, I spent quite a bit of my time writing, challenging some of the crazier trans campaigns that take place. And um, in fact, the book on Lucy Meadows is going to be criticising some of the way in which that, those cam that campaign was conducted. So I'm known for criticising wrong-headed actions and words from some of the more extreme uh, trans activist campaigns. And one of the main criticisms tends to be there is too much focus on trans rights and trans only and not actually engaging in dialogue, conversation, discussion with other groups, such as, for example, between trans women and feminists. There's too much shouting across the trenches. And in particular, I've been critical of a term you may have been hearing um, recently, in recent years, uh, the term is CIS, spelled C-I-S. It was all known uh, in popular usage by trans people, particularly in this country, until 2010. Um, up until then, trans people would have said, non-trans, because that's what it means. It's a way of describing people who aren't trans, where you're making a comparison. I oppose it because once you give a name to another group that they haven't chosen for themselves, it's only a short step for the extremists in your own community to start to use that term to promote hatred. And that's precisely what happened in the middle of last year when a hashtag went up on Twitter, F cis people. It wasn't F that was saying it. And the obvious idea behind the person who started that is that they would end up on the Twitter trending board. So this offensive word, um, hashtag, would actually be appearing to everyone who came onto Twitter. Thankfully, it never achieved that. Um, and it, it ended up with fairly humorous responses from people like me. I was in a relationship with a cis person who says, well, yes, I do regularly um, F cis person. Um, <laughs> and there's lots of other things along, along those lines. You might detect a slight Northern Irish accent. <laughs> I grew up in Belfast in the middle of a civil war. I know all about, from bitter experience, how words turn to hatred, hatred turns to conflict, conflict turns to people getting killed. And um, so when I wrote in response to that F cis people thing, an article about let's just dump the word cis, what I said is, if you promote this type of hatred, no matter how justified you think your hatred is, what you end up with, as I know all too well, is 30 years of shootings and bombings. And it's not a pleasant thing to live through. Now, the people who promote hatred through social media don't like to be challenged. And this is where I disagree very much with the language of privilege because privilege checking has become the cloak for these hate mongers to hide behind. When they get challenged, almost immediately they're accusing someone saying, oh, you have cis privilege, you have non-trans privilege. And often it's used against me. People see what I write and as being critical. I'm not joining in what the rest of the trans community are saying. And they start saying, oh, you must be a radical feminist. You must be a cis person. You can't possibly be trans and actually criticizing this. Well, I spent my teenage years in the peace movement uh, as a, an Ulster Protestant. He definitely wasn't an Ulster Unionist in Northern Ireland. I'm well used to knowing that if you want to change, you've got to stand up sometimes for the majority of your own community. And so I would like, because pri my problem with privilege checking is it stops the conversation. 
When you say to someone, you've got white privilege, you've got cis privilege, uh, you've got able-bodied privilege, what you're saying is, you can't speak on this topic. If on the other hand, you go back to an older idea from within uh, feminist discourse, the appeal to experience, the argument from experience, you say, you're misunderstanding this because you have not experienced being black, being trans, um, being disabled, whatever. When the focus is on experience, the conversation continues. When the focus is on the language of privilege, and particularly in the way the social media attitude of calling out privileges, then that means that the conversation stops, the dialogue doesn't happen, and you don't move on to peace. The conflict just gets worse. And if I move on to, um, I am getting near the end. If I move on to uh, briefly some of the themes that were talked about in terms of the blurb for this particular session, is feminism too white and too middle class? It depends on what you mean by those terms. I'm speaking to you here in Britain, and that means I am not white. When I was researching my novel in Seattle, I was white in a horrendously white city. And the reason is nothing to do with um, how many white people around me. But in the 1990s, the British government did research on Irish people in Britain. And they discovered that the levels of discrimination against Irish people and the low levels of employment opportunities and the assumption that as soon as I open my mouth, I'm a thick paddy, rather than some of a PhD from an Irish university is one of the top in the world. Because of all that, our white Irish became a separate ethnic group. It doesn't always happen, but all employers are supposed to monitor that separately. So I'm in the odd situation that when I'm in Britain, I'm not white. If I go home to Northern Ireland, I become white, because, that partic because equality legislation operates differently in the part of the UK that I actually come from. And in terms of middle class, it's already been raised this issue. Is, middle, is your class about the class you're brought up in or the class you grew into? When I was a university lecturer, a colleague said to me, you're not a lecturer, you're middle class, you've got to drop the rock music and listen to opera. So was I working class? Was I middle class? And um, so it's what you ask about those terms is will get you what, what the uh, answer should be about is feminism too white or too middle class? But I would hope that we continue the conversations by listening to one another's um, experiences. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask Nan Sloan to speak now. Um, she's the founder and director of Centre for Women and Democracy, based in Leeds, where my daughter is. Um, and she has a very wide experience of, of the two subjects, democracy and uh, politics. She's held public office and worked in, senior, in a senior role for a political party and it doesn't tell us which one. Um, and she now publish, publishes research on women's participation and cam campaigns for greater diversity in public life. She's an experienced trainer and mentor and um, has um, provided workshops and uh, leadership training in the UK, Ireland, and North Africa. She's the author of Sex and Power 2013, Who Runs Britain? I don't know if you saw the paper reports today, Nan, which said how much the cuts, how much, much, much more, the cuts are affecting women. Um, and if any woman, any woman votes for a party which has brought these cuts, shame on you. Um, thank you very much. Um, as you are gathered from the introduction, I spend a lot of my time thinking about power. 
who has it, how they get it, why they've got it, what they use it for when they've got it. And one of the inescapable things that you start to think about when you look at these issues is the lack of diversity in who has access to power structures right across the board. And we're not just talking about the, the rarefied um, levels of parliament and the cabinet and all the rest of it that um, sometimes the um, broadsheets concentrate on, but right down to very localized levels of power. Um, uh, localism is something that's a great deal of talk about at the moment. All the political parties are very keen on it. They're keen to devolve, to devolve power to local people. But when you go and look at who it is that they are devolving power to, you will find it is exactly the same people who are themselves doing the devolving. And um, so that forces you to start to look at how power is structured and how uh, you can start to break open some of those structures to broaden access. The particular area that I've been asked to talk about <laughs> this afternoon is class, but I have to say that what you, say about, what you can say about class applies just as much to other groups and that, that all the principles of intersectionality which we can discuss apply as much to class as to anything else. So the first thing I would say is that in answer to the question, is feminism too white and middle class, I would say unquestionably, historically, yes. If only because working class women have been almost entirely excluded from feminism for the whole of its history. It is very hard to name working class feminists. There are one or two, but they are hard to name. And if you go to most people and ask them if they can name a feminist, they will come up with some variety of Pankhurst and possibly one or two others, and then they will be stuck. And part of the reason for that is that feminism has failed over decades to make itself relevant to women whose experience and whose um, economic circumstances have not allowed them to engage with the kind of campaigning fe feminism that has developed. You need time to be the sort of feminist that we recognize. You need money, you need childcare, you need access to travel, you need to be able to, um, uh, you need a reasonable level of education just to be able to read the debates within feminism, even assuming that your daily struggle to make ends meet, feed the children, get them to school, do all the things that you need to do, enabled you to, to make time to do that. And for that reason, feminism is almost wholly irrelevant to most communities in this country. And unless as feminists of whatever variety and however we define ourselves, we recognize that, then we're going to continue to be a small group of people talking to one another about issues and controversies that do not matter anywhere else. The other problem that we have is that because we live in a class um, ridden society. We are obsessed with class in a way that most other cultures or many other cultures are not. Because of that and because power both in terms of, not, not just in terms of polit political power but also in terms of power in the media, power in opinion forming, power in, in determining what is culturally valuable and what is not valuable is in the hands of predominantly white middle class people, what is the other lacks value? And so we end up in a situation where working class culture is turned into reality programs for the entertainment of middle class people. And if you are a working class person, to see your experience of life turned into entertainment for other people doesn't exactly impel you to engage with those people in any kind of meaningful way. Because 
that you're not something or somebody they actually care about, you are somebody they, want, they can make a joke of. And whether you're, uh, you know, you can go back through a whole list of things, the most recent of which is, is Benefit Street, they are entertainment programs made for people other than the people who are exploited by them. And you can go across the country and find examples of um, uh, the whole of working class culture being treated as both something other and something inferior. That is not to say that all working class culture is necessarily particularly attractive, because there are all sorts of issues uh, within working class communities, but they are largely not engaged with by what I may, as somebody from Leeds, term a middle class metropolitan elite that talks largely to itself. Since I come from Leeds, we can, the final point I want to touch on is the issue of regionalism. If you speak with a regional accent, which most working class people do, people will make all sorts of assumptions about you, your intelligence, your education, your background, your level of aspiration, what you're capable of achieving, and whether or not you are a fit person to hold power of one kind or another. They will judge uh, your, what you think, they will judge um, your politics, they will just, without ever actually asking you, make all sorts of um, assumptions about you. And the problem with that is that when we do achieve the holy grail of getting a tiny number of working class people through the system into positions of power, we end up in the position of um, their accents being laughed at by the decision makers they have joined. And you, you will see that there are women in Parliament who have recently said that when they get up to speak, they are laughed at because of their accents. Now, in those circumstances, it's very difficult to see how people are going to be seriously, believe that they will be taken seriously if they put themselves forward. So the answer to the questions I say is, feminism to middle class uh, and white, I, clearly it's yes, but I would add metropolitan to that. And I would say that unless we take the class issue seriously, and unless we begin to have a serious conversation about that, particularly for women, but also for men, we are never going to get the kind of society in which we have the kind of diversity we'd all like to see. Thank you. And just to cheer you up, there's a programme in the pipeline, I don't know if people here have heard about it, the sister of Boris Johnson, Rachel, is going on a poverty safari. She's going to go among the poor on a safari. Um, and we look forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, the, our last uh, final uh, speaker is um, Eleanor Linz. Lisney, the uh, founder of uh, Sisters of Frida. She's a cooperative of disabled women, and they've played an amazingly important part in ensuring that disabled people were mentioned, were part of the 213 report of the UN Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Um, she's the co-founder co of Disabled People Against Cuts, and if there's one issue, actually, that feminism and anti-racism and equality warriors should be absolutely up about, it is the, these cuts, especially for disabled people. I really think we have to do this together. Um, she, uh, she's also um, the director of a community organization, Connect Culture, member of the British Council's Disability Advisory Panel, and um, the advisory panel to access to elected office fund. She, obviously, she's a strong advocate of accessibility and, un, and better design, uh, universal design. And um, our transport system tells us all we need to know about how much work there still has to be done on design and equality. So, Eleanor, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Jasmine, and, and thank you for letting me be the last speaker as well. Uh, when I was asked to do this, uh, I found it very difficult because I had to understand myself what it means 
by privilege as a disabled woman of color. And it took me a long time to come up with a, a speech. And actually, so I uh, hope you forgive me if I, I ramble a bit. Um, disability intersects, we've already talked about intersectionality, but disability intersects class, gender, ethnicity, race, religion, age, and sexual orientation. And it's also a great leveler. Uh, you can be of the royal family. And this week, in the Telegraph, the Queen's cousin, Catherine Bowes Lyon, had a headline, Peace at last for the Queen's cousin, said she was mentally handicapped. Um, for me, that insinuates that she's actually better off dead even though she's of the royal family. Can I say firstly, I prefer not to use the term able-bodied, but non-disabled, because not all impairments are physical. Some are hidden. Some people have invisible disabilities. And to think about privilege, I thought I could do it the opposite. I could say, if maybe I can give you a list of privileges of a non-disabled feminist. You, get, you don't get discriminated, example, from before you are born, aborted because you're disabled. Um, sorry, lost my page two. Here we are. You do not get shunted to special schools. And as a young girl growing up, you do not get excluded by girl talk because you're disabled. Most people consider you're not sexual. You do not always have the choice of marriage and motherhood because the powers to be think that you cannot have the responsibility. So as a disabled feminist, you don't get the choices of being uh, deciding to be single or a stay-at-home mom. And as a non-disabled woman does not have to wait for support to have showers or go to the toilet and make that kind of decision. It's not the local authorities who decides whether you are eligible to have those needs met. To wait for a care package which might have some support for you to have a, that bit of, that modicum of independent living. And you won't have to organize everything you do, so it, it's very difficult to be spontaneous. For example, you have, if you want to take the train, you have to give the train services 48 hours notice every time you want to go anywhere. You have to book your support, your personal assistance, because without support, you can't go. You have to organize your energy, because if you do one event, you have to rest before you can do something else. You might have to make extra time, because you, the bus you want to take might have buggies in it, and you can't get on. Society won't think that you are undateable, and to compound it by putting it on a television program, you don't have to ask every time to go somewhere whether it's accessible. And most of the time, if you ask, they don't have an idea what you need. And every time you want to go somewhere new, you have to look up online to check up where's your next accessible toilet. And non-accessible people, you, and you find non-accessible people using them sometimes when you're really bursting to go. And to put it even a, a more sort of serious note, you are even more vulnerable to be raped and abused. There's a report out this week in The Independent said that rape of vulnerable women, especially those with learning difficulties, has effectively been I can't read my own handwriting, been decriminalized. And in domestic abuse, access and support is of, often controlled by the abuser. 
I have not mentioned those who get all the brownie points and gets even more impacted by the cumulative effect of the social re welfare reforms. And then there's the rhetoric of the scrounger that you know, you're a useless eater because you depend on benefits. And so, and disability hate crimes rise. Um, so, uh, privilege is a, is, a difficult, is a difficult thing to, to, to imagine or, or to sort of stress on when you're disabled. Because you can have all the education, you can have, you, as I said before, you can be of the royal family, it doesn't matter what class you are. Yesterday, um, Baroness Tenny Gray Thompson was here, and she said about you know how she's been discriminated against. So, I think I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you.